I will start now. So I will be talking about uh, a little bit about me. So from ASB in Senegal, then uh, I will discuss more seriously about um, the industry-based innovation in quantum transport and nanoelectronics and explain a little bit of the theory uh, on which this is based, uh, quantum transport and electronic structure theory. And later on, I'll discuss what is ha what's happening now with uh, molecular junctions uh, regarding thermoelectricity. So uh, from about me now, uh, from, uh, so I graduated from uh, University of Lume, and then I moved to AIMS, Ghana, and this is uh, in 2014. Then after I went to ASP in Senegal, uh, between uh, in August. Then after I, I went to France for a master program that is P3TME, it is a kind of theoretical physics, but it's actually built by CPPM. Uh, it's a master program uh, made by CPPM Marseille and uh, CPP, the Center for Theoretical Physics. CPPM is Center for Particle Physics of Marseille where Steve Mwenza actually is working. So he was actually the person who taught me supersymmetry course in that program. So, and also he, uh, it was nice to meet him at ASP in Senegal because it made me uh, easy for me to integrate the program in France once I get here, I already knew him. And then just after my master program, I got this uh, French um, fellowship, uh, scholarship for PhD pro program in France. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> so I did the PhD and after I went uh, to, for a postdoc in Japan, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. So I got a fellowship there. And since this year, March, I'm here in Germany for postdoc. So let me uh, say a little bit about ASP, some of my memories on ASP. So this is our group picture at ASP. And uh, what I noticed, uh, it is very amazing to see uh, that this guy here, <laughs> actually laughing too much, but you can see that it was really a very happy mood. And uh, yeah, <laughs> he was seriously laughing actually. So I'm hidden somewhere here. So you can see me uh, somewhere here. Uh, can you see when I'm point, I point? No? No. Okay. <laughs> so I need to, I don't think. Yes, yes, now we can, sorry. Ah, Senegal, okay. Senegal. Okay, good. So uh, here is another picture of uh, ASP 2014. Uh, so you can see this uh, on the left side, it is a special picture because it is uh, me, Kosi and Clementine, uh, we're all coming from AIDS Ghana. So this is, uh, and this picture actually remind me something very important that is uh, networking because the main thing is that one of us actually heard about ASP and we never heard about ASP before. And since one of us heard and we shared among us the information and we ended up three of us going into ASP. So just to say how networking is really important in, uh, in this situation actually. And this is uh, Gori Island. Okay, so I think that is all. Uh, for ASP, this is just short, but it can't actually show how important is ASP contribution to African science, right? So then my personal interest of research actually is based on, okay, I want to make a kind of link. So it's basically a course uh, is linked to quantum field theory, advanced quantum field theory application to nanoelectronics. So this is what I, uh, how I classify the field where I'm working. So it's a subfield of physics, computational physics, but nanoelectronics. But when you go to the classical way of viewing things, it's kind of electrical engineering. So sometimes you see what I do in electrical engineering, uh, 
uh, field, but also we are coming from physics side. So recently I've been working on quantum interference in single molecular junctions and mechanosensitivity in molecular junctions. But yeah, I will show more about that in coming uh, slides. But I've been working on quantum dots uh, for energy filters in solar cells for my master thesis. This gave this first paper I posted here because it was my first paper I released in 2016 and I was happy. And my thesis was about time dependent transport. So, time dependent transport in nanoelectronics. I will not say much about it here, but uh, I think because I choose to speak about uh, thermoelectricity, but it was fully about how to implement optimize. Uh, transport uh, algorithm, a numerical algorithm to actually improve how we can compute this uh, electronic transport in nano devices. But I will skip that for this talk. <laughs> okay, so this is my interest of research, and also I go like I got engaged into science, so uh, into helping for science in Africa. So with some of my friends and Kosi here and some of the scientists at the physics department, uh, University of Lomé, and also in other universities, we actually created this network that we call African Scientific Integration Network, just to promote connection between scientists from uh, diaspora and uh, uh, the scientists in Africa. So this is, the idea of this network. So what we do is to create connections. So we try now to create working groups uh, to connect these uh, scientists, but we actually succeeded in one thing fully is to create a, this we call a regional curriculum for science, uh, for physics and application is a platform where People come together, scientists basically, PhD student and uh, postdoc and uh, senior scientists from Africa and diaspora, and uh, try to connect together, share experience because most of the problems about research and science in Africa is related to the fact that people don't have platforms also to learn, but also to 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 expose what they are doing. Uh, so that other people bring their comment and uh, discussion on that. So from uh, what uh, ASP is doing, AIMS and so on, other organization, we got inspired and we said we can bring in something uh, to help in that direction. So we are working to improve it. So next edition, Nigeria, uh, there is a need. So it's Covenant University, uh, I think, who actually we, we who actually organized the next section in 2022. Okay, so this is about uh, how we got engaged in some sense on the continent to really bring inputs of science. So now let's talk about the topic of today. Uh, yes, I still have some of these pictures. So this was picture for the official launch of uh, this original curriculum on physics and application in Lomé. So this is the political side. Then for serious uh, activities, this is just for this, just to show you a few pictures of what was going on. Okay, so now nanoscale. So I want to clarify one thing and make sure we are all, uh, I'm not sure everyone is working in the same thing like me. So nanoscale is just what you see. So uh, a human being is about 10 to the power nine uh, nanometers height. So, so it's one meter, actually one or two meters. So it's in this scale. So nanoscale devices are just devices that have uh, 100 to 10,000 uh, times smaller than human uh, cell. So you can imagine that this is very, very small. You can see the scale here. Now you can see the size of the cell and imagine something that would be 10,000 times smaller. Okay, so this is nanoscale. Then when it comes to these scales, you need to see which kind of theory, which kind of uh, uh, 
physics we used to describe. So I set the scale here. You can see uh, where you apply continuum mechanics on uh, millimeter scale, but when it comes to nanometer scales, you apply this molecular dynamics or quantum uh, mechanics or density functional theory, whatever you want. But I will clarify what is molecular dynamics, quantum uh, density functional theory, and so on. Okay, just to clarify what is nanometer scale. Good. So, what is actually wh where are we in this field? So, I show here this. Um, okay. <laughs> I think I need to. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so you can see uh, on this plot uh, quantum. Uh, mechanics, uh, atomic simulation, device modeling, and uh, on the right side, device parameters, and empirical device modeling. Okay. What's happening is you can look on the right side as if when you go to electrical engineering, and then on the left side, you are in physics, quantum physics course in any of these, or in any of these materials. So, at some point, these two fields actually come together in the middle somewhere here. So this is where we are actually, where we are somewhere in the middle uh, at the connection between electrical engineering and this uh, quantum physics field. So it's more about doing computational physics. So in the classical way, it was called technology computer aid design TCAD or TK. And uh, if you look, um, and what happened there is just to do very heavy numerical simulations. Then at some point you get to this uh, small scale where you can do, you can have very small devices at uh, the size uh, that I told a nanometer scale. Then you require new tools uh, that, that are directly coming from quantum mechanics to simulate these. So I draw here this uh, quantum ETK is, um, a package that has been developed by this company called Synopsys. And uh, it actually includes some of these programs to simulate devices. So you can see DFT. Uh, I will explain these uh, in the next coming slide. So you can simulate uh, solar cells. So you can simulate solar cells with TIC kit, uh, technology computer edge design programs, but this is uh, in the classical way, or you can do TCAD in the quantum mechanics way. And you can see there are packages like NanoHub. There are websites like NanoHub. Uh, NanoHub, okay. Uh, this is developed by Purdue University. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it is uh, quite free of use. You can just check. So. To work on transistors and so on. Okay, so this is just to show where we are. And okay, so the question now is uh, on industrial side, how does it go? I will show first on industry, how industries uh, actually use these technologies. Uh, these are quantum computing, uh, no, not quantum computing, quantum based uh, softwares uh, programs. And then we'll just see how we can do it in theory. So basically, nowadays people are expecting that we can get to these technologies like right? cloud computing, AI, 5G, intelligent AI, quantum computing, and so on. But I wanted to raise the fact that these technologies and even those that exist uh, today mostly depends on what is happening in, uh, in these uh, nano electronic companies or uh, these uh, semiconductor companies. So recently we saw this paper by this paper, uh, this uh, achievement by um, IBM achieving two nanometer chip. I know this idea of saying two nanometer chip is not, is not, might not speak to you if you are not from the field, but I will tell you why. So these two nanometer chip is the size of the channel of a transistor. I'll come back to that as well. 
I'm coming back to so a lot of things. So there is a prediction like uh, this on the right side, this figure show how uh, technology size have been increase, uh, decreasing, like uh, how nano devices size have been decreasing and achieved by different com companies uh, since these last five years, like uh, seven nanometers, uh, 10 nanometers, six nanometers achieved by TSMC, uh, Samsung, uh, Semiconductor, Intel, and so on. So these technologies, uh, technological nodes uh, achievement is what bring in much more power in computing, much more functionalities in your computer or your phone. And so it will actually transform this why it says this actually will change a business and so on. So some uh, TSMC is uh, one of the biggest chip producer in the world. So it's a Taiwanese company, Taiwanese semiconductor uh, manufacturing company. Okay, good. So let's come back to this story of uh, uh, chip and two nanometers. So um, you can see on this graph here since uh, years 1971, how the, the size of the chip actually made the change of the computer. You evolved from these uh, 40004 and you ended up at some point with uh, AMD, Pentium and uh, quad core and so on. This kind of involvement are induced by the achievement into the cheap performance, like reducing the size so that you can include more, uh, you can have high density, I will, I will show you now. So it, uh, there is a law that's called Moore's law that said, okay, the, the number of transistor on a silicon chip will double every year. And that law is what has been actually been followed since several years. And this actually reduced the size of the transistor. And once it reduced the size of the channel of your transistor, you can actually include more transistors on a single chip. So for instance, uh, in 2018, uh, yeah, in 2018, uh, people reached, uh, semiconducting companies reached this uh, 10 nanometers technology, which it means you can include uh, on uh, one millimeter, uh, let's say 100 uh, million uh, transistors on one millimeter. So this make you input more, um, more functionalities to your technology. Okay, good. So a transistor is just, uh, okay, something like this. So a transistor is just something like this where you have, for instance, some material like silicon, uh, you put, you grow up these materials and then you have a source and drain, right? And inside this, uh, Connecting the source and drain, you just put uh, some materials. And this one will be the channel, the L. And this channel length is what is reducing what you saw on this, uh, like achieving two nanometers. Okay, like this. L is two nanometer, L is, as you make it short, you make it more efficient and you make it, uh, you can put more on the same surface. So, the, the transistor actually have two roles, right? The transistor has two roles. Uh, it can be used as amplifier, or it can be used as a switch. Amplifier is like a water, uh, a switch is like a water tap. Your transistor is just like a water tap. So you have something called gate, and then you have the source and the drain, right? So your gate is just the top controller. And if you, you close, there is no water. And if you open, there is water, okay? So you have zero and one, but actually what you see is just a signal. There is no signal, signal, no signal, signal. And then you can use, uh, by controlling the gate, you can use it as a switch on and off. So you can write, this is where you, you can write the uh, numbers like zero one and then write everything you want. You can encode it and so on. This is one function of um, 
switching function of the transistor. And also, you know, when you input current into your transistor, you can actually amplify it. So, so at the end, you can get uh, an amplified signal. So, this, you can use many transistors and put them together, amplifying at each end, and you end up with a high signal. So, this is what we use as amplifier. So, your uh, your earphone and so on. This is uh, one of the role of these transistors. So this is just to show you that these things are very useful in everyday life and uh, mostly controlled by semiconductor technology, uh, uh, semiconductor industry. So what I do uh, on my side, what I do is everyday life. So everyday life is just to do high performance computing. So everyday life is writing codes. <laughs> so starting from theory, writing codes like this one here. So based on some of these um, material, you input some materials. I'll show you how we input it. And then you just write some simulation on uh, high performance computing, like cluster like this one. This is called Diego. It's from Okinawa Institute of Science. Uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. So they have a very high computing resource. And uh, yeah, so everyday life is writing codes and working on theory. Okay, that's all, bingo. So which kind of theory? So the theory is simple, uh, no, not simple, but <laughs> the theory is about different things. So I need two things to do what I do. I need the electronic structure, I need to do the transport. So the electronic structure, depending on the type of thing you want to do, you can just work on uh, with density functional theory. And this density functional theory has been very successful uh, for molecules in quantum chemistry because they work on very, uh, let's say molecules, so very small size, object, so you can input it in uh, these codes. But uh, when you want to work basically in semiconducting companies, they use uh, very uh, semi-classical approximations like k dot p or type banding. So these approximations are just uh, some kind of fitting of uh, experimental data. I know something when it says experimental data on silicon or gallium arsenide then you feed this parameter to get uh, the electronic structure. And here, when I say electronic structure, I just mean um, the Hamiltonian. Okay, I need information about the Hamiltonian of the system. So this is mostly the most, uh, the most important one. Then once you choose your method of doing the calculating the electronic structure, you can also, uh, you can now think about the transport. So for the transport, um, one of, you can use Boltzmann transport, you can use NEGF, NEGF is non-equilibrium green function formalism. And uh, you can use uh, drift diffusion. So drift diffusion is most, the most used one in uh, electrical engineering in most of the semiconducting companies uh, since um, several years. And recently, they are moving to non-equilibrium green functions. Boltzmann transport as well is used in semiconducting companies, but NEGF is kind of um, um, recent, like they started using it very recently because it is kind of new in the in the com in companies. I remember one of my colleagues from um, South Korea actually moved to France to do his PhD on NEGF uh, because he was working for Samsung in South Korea and they were always using these classical uh, drift diffusion and he said he was tired of it. He wanted to learn something new. So this is both trap. I think I missed something, there is a Z somewhere. So these are, let's say Bootstrap is uh, free. You can use it, you can try it. Silvaco is not free. Okay, in NEGF, you have these, um, Transiesta is free, Nemo Omen. Nemo Omen is, okay, it's free if you ask. 
Oman is free if you ask. But the short story about Nemo Oman is, <laughs> Nemo was developed by Purdue University, uh, Klimek, uh, uh, and uh, one of his PhD, uh, his postdoc was uh, Luisier, and Luisier developed Omen. If you look carefully, you'll see that Nemo is just reading o Omen in the reverse order. <laughs> So there was something like, uh, okay, um, Klimek actually was not happy because uh, his postdoc developed the same, uh, the same software like him and he sued him and stories like that. But it ended up that uh, Omen is now the property of uh, ETH and the new Purdue University. <laughs> So once you do the transport, you can actually extract the, you can do the data analysis. So you can extract whatever you want to carry in the conductance or the thermal power. You, you, you choose what you want to extract. Okay, now let's look at how we can build the electronic structure. So electronic structure, simple here. Okay, let me remove. Let me remind you something first. So from the atomic scale, when you start from atoms, then the electronic structure, you can see these uh, energies levels on your atom or molecule, right? As you start increasing the number of um, molecules, the number of atoms, so you are going to molecular level, then you have a split right here. And you have this, that will be called the homo, the homos, because there are several. This one is the homo, and uh, you have the lumos. So the homo is a highly occupied molecular orbitals, and the uh, lumo is the lower, lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals. So you have this split. So, but the most important thing is that you end up having this a gap. So this is why you see when you you do the same with uh, crystals and so on. So you have this the gap. Okay, good. <laughs> I have to clean this. So what happened uh, to do uh, the transport, the, the electronic structure, you just use uh, Schrodinger's equation. Very simple, Schrodinger's equation here. So you want to include um, the kinetic term for the nucleus, the electrons, and the potential. So this potential will include electron-electron interaction, electron-nucleus interaction, nucleus-nucleus interaction. So one of the important approximation is to assume that since uh, the nucleus are heavy, then you can describe them classically. So you can just describe the nucleus like this and assume they are fixed, then you only keep the kinetic term for the electronic, the electronic kinetic term, right? Then if you combine these two equations, you have what is, uh, you, uh, what is called, solving these two equations, you have molecular dynamics, what is called molecular dynamics. So you can follow the dynamics of uh, chemical reactions and so on by doing that. Good, but one big problem in solving these, uh, let's clean this first. One big problem in solving these is uh, the electronic interaction. Why? If you take the potential, uh, the interaction potential here, it includes nucleus interaction, right? Uh, and, and interaction, uh, electron nucleus interaction, but it includes electronic interactions. One of the big problem is how you, you evaluate this electronic interaction because it's uh, electrons are moving around the nucleus and there are many electrons and uh, even if you assume Coulombic interaction, then you don't know for sure the position of every electron and some of the electron will be actually screened by some nucleus and so on. So 
since we, we don't know how to compute it properly, then there is, you have to do an approximation. And uh, this guy actually found a very good approximation as function of Kolsham. Uh, uh, he found a very good approximation as function of the density. This is the definition of the density. It's just the modular square of the wave function. Okay. So once you, you do this approximation, then you get the final form of your uh, density functional theory equation. And uh, this potential is just an approximation you do. And the, this is where people do several approximations. So there are several approximations to this potential now in the literature. Solving this happen, uh, solving this also, you need to know what is the shape of the wave function of your electron. So most of the time you can assume different type of shape. So people assume, uh, like you can assume that your wave functions are plane waves. So, okay. So if you assume your wave functions are plane waves um, here, so you have these Castep, VASP, Abinit. These are the name of existing softwares that have been developed or that have been developed, yes, uh, but by, by assuming that this wave function here is just behaving like a, uh, a plane wave. And similarly, you have numerical, so just discretizing directly or using Gaussian or using atomic orbitals. So you have different, uh, a very huge zoo of uh, these um, software existing for solving the EFT code. Good, so this is just, I am making it very short in the sense. Okay, so this is just to show you a few results of uh, that GFT have achieved to tell you this is a very trustable theory or th these packages you can trust them properly because you can see here where we we have for instance for the experiment what what you get for the experiment is almost close to what you get for uh, the theory right so which shows that uh, DFT is something you can trust. You can trust for very some of the, the materials or the molecules at uh, let's say 95%. So similarly, you, you can get uh, here the vibrational frequencies of uh, small molecules. Uh, what theory gave you almost close to the experiment as well. And also the the bonds, anger, length, and so on. So globally, DFT is something you can trust for doing uh, calculation basically on small molecules. And it has been really uh, a lot used uh, in, uh, in quantum chemistry. Okay, good. So now I will talk to you. So this is the electronic structure side, like how to get the Hamiltonian. This is one way, the one way that is density functional theory. And this density functional theory is difficult to apply to crystals now. Like it's difficult, you can apply to crystals, of course, because you can just use plane waves. But the thing is, uh, if you want to simulate a nanostructure that is like, let's say, um, let's say uh, 20 nanometers, you want to input 20 nanometers of uh, each atom with each, uh, every single electron uh, moving around each uh, atom in this uh, structure, and you have to take into account every orbital, you end up with metrics that will be too heavy for our computational capacities now, because you can end up with, uh, let's say 10,000 by 10,000 matrices to invert or something like this. So, Basically, you, this is why most of the electro, uh, most of the people working in semiconductor industry things goes to semi-empirical approximations like K dot E, Thai banding, and so on. This in these models you can simplify the size of your your Hamiltonian or your electronic structure. Okay, let's come to the transport. 
for the transport is uh, now once you get the Hamiltonian, you can go to the transport. The transport, so what do you do from your DFT or your K dot B is to get this, what is inside this box here. What is inside this box? These level, these are just energy levels in your box, right? So you, you get it accurately from DFT. Then what you want to do now is to do the transport. So you connect your, your material with something else, right? You connect, so you have connections. Then you apply a bias on the left and the right uh, of your materials. So, so that you have uh, some electronic flow. And this electronic flow will actually bring current that you can measure and so on. So once you induce this bias, you have, um, you have, uh, let's say, you have a current outflow. Good. But what you have to know is this gate. So if you want to make a transistor now, you have to put a gate. And the gate, what your gate would do is here. Your gate is doing this. So your gate will just shift this down or up depending on whether you apply a positive or a negative gate bias. So, so if you push, you are, let's say you apply a negative bias, then you push them all down. Then in the window, in this window, the transport actually happened in this window. You see, between the two chemical potential you apply on the left and right. So if you move them too much so that there is no energy level in between the two chemical potentials, there is no current flow. So this is what happens. So your gate bias will just be moving these levels so you have current or no current, then you can use it as a switch. Good. Um, okay, I'll just um, clean here. So this is just to show you the transport side. Then let's see how we can feel the current on a very single level. Like let's assume we have only one single level from our electronic structure evaluation. So we get one here. So what you want to do is you evaluate just, let's say you have n electrons sitting on that level. So you just want to evaluate the current flowing uh, from the left to the right or the right to the left. So you just want to see how this here, okay? So the electronic distribution, uh, this here, Fermi uh, F1 minus N is just this here, right? Is what I put in color here. And you want to see how this will fill this space here how much you can send here, how much of this you can send here. So this is what happened here, this thing, and then you end up getting this, right? The difference is just the difference between the two Fermi level and this gamma actually here will just be by which, uh, by which rate uh, these carriers are flowing to the single level. That is um, the only thing. So you get a very simple expression for the current flowing, right? Okay. Now, let's say this is true. Now you know all the electronic, the electrons will not have the same energy. So you need to sum up over all the electronic levels and all the energy. So this is why you need to add this integral here to account for all the energy. So all the electrons will not have the same energy, but something happened, your gamma should be changed. Why? The gamma you have here, you need to change it. Why? I'll tell you now, because when you connect, when you connect your material with something else, you, your level inside will not be uh, the same. It will just broaden because of the connection. So you need to take into account the fact that connecting your uh, isolated material to something else will actually affect the, the level in the middle. So this is why you have this TE here 
that will take into account the fact that you are burdening your level inside the system. Okay, good. So in total, you will have this for one single level. And we can actually evaluate by how much this single level can be conducted. Uh, but what is the maximum uh, current flowing through this level or what is the, the maximum capacity of current flow? So this is what you get here. This is G naught, that is the quantum conductance. Uh, Katawura, there is a question in the chat um, uh -huh. from Fati. Yeah. Um, she wants you to explain <clears throat> more about the difference between the approximation of uh, Ohenberg cone and uh, and cone sham Hartree fork. Okay, so Hartree fork is just um, Hartree fork is just the uh, the lower level approximation of uh, this the functional tube. So. This uh, okay. So this, uh, let's say, okay. So this wave function actually here. So the way you evaluate it in R three fork, and this potential here. So the potential of R three doesn't take into account all the exchange effect. All the exchange effect induced by the electronic. Like, for instance, if you have one electron here, another one here, and the players here, artery fork just assume, uh, uh, artery fork actually don't take into account, for instance, this uh, nucleus here, this effect of screening. This is called screening, for instance or uh, this dynamic motion, because dynamic motion is the fact that uh, this electron here at some time T1 will come here at some time T2, but the, your evaluation of uh, what is the interaction, the Coulomb interaction between uh, electron one, electron two here, and the new position of electron one, electron two, maybe electron two will come here, uh, after fork doesn't take into account these things. So this is why after fork is a more rough approximation that is less accurate to this uh, compared to this dysfunctional theory. But yes, if you want, I can just, um, at some point we can discuss if you are really interested in that, okay? I, I think maybe we can, yeah, we can write to me anytime we can discuss. Okay. So this is what happens. So you have here, so you know how to compute the current for one single level. So now if we want to increase the number of level, have many levels, for instance, how do you compute the current? So I will introduce something, <laughs> okay? How do you compute the current? So for many levels, I will introduce the green function. So the green functions is something simple. So you have your Schrodinger's equation, right? For isolated system, this is your Schrodinger's equation stationary. So in transport, if you solve this, you don't take into account the fact that your system, for instance, here in transport is not your isolated system alone. It's something you connect. You connect with some connection. You have some connections so that you have carrier will flow from left or right. So this thing to take it into account, you need to add additional term here. That is inflow. This take into account the inflow this take into account the outflow of electrons. So, of course, this is not only because of that, but you can convince yourself that this, this equation, you can actually write it back like this. And green functions have been used uh, a lot in mathematics to solve um, differential equations. So, you can also read on that, but it is very useful here because the reason is, I'll show you next. 
because if you have many levels, the difference between a green function and a wave function is that a green function is a matrix, n by n matrix, but a wave function is just a vector. So you can easily handle a lot of uh, phenomena, like a lot of uh, wave functions in a single green function. So by a single computation, by inverting a matrix, you get by, this is just the inverse of this matrix. So by inverting this matrix, you just get information on different wave functions. So this object, as you can see, has a pole. So we need to include, um, we need to include this small term, this small n term complex number is just fake. So avoid that any time that you have energies same like EP, remember EP is uh, the energy here. Oh, okay, EP is any of these. You can call this EP, the value of this energy. So anytime you have an electron with the same energy like EP, you want to avoid this to go to uh, zero, EP minus, uh, e minus EP. So you do that. Okay, good. So these green functions will help us to handle easily the many level cases. So now let's come to many level cases. So many level cases is this one where you can actually uh, now input all the levels you have is this H, right? Your Hamiltonian. Because remember, we had G equal to one over E minus EP plus this small thick number. But this EP here was H because H was only one single level. Now when you have many levels, you need to put the full matrix of H uh, here. So this is why it's changed. And then your correction to your, uh, the correction to your Schrodinger's equation because of the interactions come here into these terms. So um, this one, that will account for the left electron in and outflow, and this one for the right. These are called self energy. And uh, once you compute this object, this green function at every energy, then you can do the same statistics and get the wave function. The only difference is this thing here, the T of E, which is the transmission function. That changes, that depends on, yes, the the in and outflow and the number of level inside your system. Good. So green functions, simple to get. But but then when you have like uh, let's say you have electronic interactions. Uh, I mean not electronic like phono. Uh, let's say sunlight. For instance, if you want to simulate solar cells, so you need to take into account the fact that you receive some uh, photons actually coming into play here. So you have to add some additional self energies here. So these additional self energies, you need to go through, um, uh, let's say field theory computation to get the right expression for, depending on the type of material you have and so on and so on. Good. And uh, from these green functions, you can extract everything you want, like electronic spectral density, the holes, and so on, the current, and so on. So you can extract everything you want. But keep in mind that the only thing your electronic structure will help you to do is to compute this Hamiltonian. That's all. You can get it from DFT, you can get it from K.T, you can get it from um, by, banding, uh, by fitting some experimental data. Good. And then one thing to handle is that uh, even if you, you take your Hamiltonian from GFT, you still have uh, some, uh, you still have to handle the electrostatics because, uh, because you put basically your, your system in between two uh, conducting, for instance, you put in between two conducting uh, wire or something, you have some charges, so you have some electrostatic effect on your system, your, your central system. 
So you need to account that properly by solving again uh, Poisson equation uh, very self-consistently to find the right potential, how each energy level uh, in your system actually have been affected from the connection. So once you have this, you can compute uh, some of the quantum effects you can observe at these ones like uh, band shift. Um, the bound energy, you can clearly see your, your bound state inside your system. So this one is, for instance, the, this is the conduction band and the balance band of the system here. This is the system. So you can see here, everything that goes from here to here is tunneling tunneling happening. So you are seeing directly the wave function. You can see, for instance, in the same system, the electronic uh, density here, you can see your wave function tail. And here you have tunneling happening, transfer band to band. This is called band to band tunneling and so on. You can, it gives you access to a lot of information about your system actually. Okay. No, I'm good. And uh, yes, as I said, you can handle phonons, you can handle uh, photons coming into your system by including additional self energy to your system. And this adds more complexity, but yes, you need to, depending on the system, in some systems it's very important. But basically, for instance, phonons, yes, yeah, phonons are okay. Photons, you know what it is for most of us, like photons is just the sunlight. <laughs> But phonons is just uh, the vibration of the ladies. So for instance, when you take a crystal, each atom in the crystal can move at a certain frequency. So, uh, so these frequencies are just the phonon frequency of your type of crystal. So yes, this is a transistor with phonons uh, scattering. So not really important. Good. So this is for NEGF. This, this is for quantum transport, how you evaluate current and so on. So this gives an overview on first how you evaluate electron structure, how you evaluate um, transport. Good. Now I will start the main topic, like thermoelectricity in molecular junctions. So I will not be so long about that. So it's just a small application, one application. So I said a lot about transistors. So I'll just say quite a bit about this, um, these molecular junctions. So molecular junctions, what happened in theory is this. So what you see on the left side is a molecule. This is porphyrin molecule. What is funny is that I'm working now on this molecule and uh, I, I still have to write the paper. <laughs> so this porphyrin molecule actually have shown very interesting properties. So what happened is that you connect the porphyrin molecule to uh, let's say gold 20. This is gold 20 uh, on the left and right. So you want to see uh, how current flow and so on. So I have to say molecules are very sensitive object. And uh, the reason why people are going to molecular electronics is because semiconducting industry have a lot of problems like uh, silicon is getting so difficult to get. Recently, for instance, a TSMC had problem with the water because Taiwanese people had water problem. Working on this uh, chip actually demand a lot of water and so on. So molecules are really abundant in nature. So if we can dump them, then we can actually replace these silicon chips by these ones, make better solar cells as well. So, but main problem is stability, how you produce the experiment, how, how strong you can bind connection between something organic and something metallic, like gold connecting to these um, molecules. So, most of the problems people are working on in the field are which are the best anchoring groups. The anchoring groups, uh, which uh, is there any molecule that is better than the other and so on and so on. 
from the experimental side, there are several techniques, but you can see here for those that are already in experiment, they can recognize this is a kind of STM technique. So this is a STM break junction. This is called STM break junction. So you just uh, make a solution. Imagine you have a pot here. So you make a solution that will contain some of these molecules you want to measure. Then you put your STM tip inside the solution and then you start removing it uh, at a very low speed, a, a very slow speed. And the idea at the end is to be able to, to end up with uh, one single molecule between the STM tip and the surface uh, of your solution. So this is what people do in experiments. And then you, you try to measure what is the current flow or you can also heat up one of the side and then do thermoelectricity. You can heat, heat the surface here or the surface here. So this is for the experiment side. So how do we... So Katawura, there are some people who say that you cannot hear. Um, oh. Are there other people uh, who cannot hear? Everybody, um, can you, you know, uh, let us know uh, you can... You hear the speaker right uh, when he was talking. All right, so some people can hear, and uh, uh, okay. then, then then let's go ahead. I think there must be uh, there must be uh, you know a the, local issue. So the quality yeah. of the sound. That's all. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead. Uh, okay, good. So so this is um, uh, okay. Yes, on top here you have this. Uh, a drawing that is just, for instance, with the theory, you can actually view properly the electronic, the orbital, the molecular orbitals in your system. You can view them properly. Uh, basically, with DFT codes, you can extract the molecular orbitals. So, the transport, the charge and heat transport in these molecular systems basically depends on the energy barrier. So the energy barrier is just the difference between the Fermi level of your metallic contact and the energy le levels in your, your junction, like your molecule and so on. So, and also it strongly depends on the coupling, the coupling between the molecule and this object called gamma here. So the coupling between the mo molecule and the, the metallic contact. Good. So you remember this formula I plotted here. It doesn't change. It doesn't change, right? Um, so if you want to see the number of electrons that flow through your system, this is same like what I described from NEGF because we use NEGF. But this formula, okay, this is just a, an approximation of what is really NEGF. Right, because this is called Landauer, uh, Landauer formula. But uh, this assumes ballistic transport. Ballistic transport means when you take um, when you take your molecule, you assume that an electron uh, an electron that moves from this side to the other side goes straight. He doesn't actually have any interaction with anything here. The reason is they assume that uh, this, uh, the length of this molecule is small compared to the mean free path of the electron. So you don't need to, uh, there is no interaction before the electron cross this molecule. But this is a very, so, um, this is working, but it's still an approximation because when you go to longer molecules or more complex molecules, then this might not hold. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so you can compute the, the conductance like this here. This is one very important object. And the unit of uh, the conductance is the quantum conductance G naught, that is two times the E square over H. Uh, and uh, it's defined like I over V, the applied, the current divided by the applied. Um, bias. Good. 
So I have to say this is the transmission function. It is really important. Then another thing is the Seebeck. The Seebeck. The Seebeck is just measuring like when you apply the, the bias, uh, you apply a temperature difference between the two ends. So you put a temperature T1 here, T2 here, and you make T1 less than T2 or T2. You apply a temperature difference instead of applying a bias. Right? Then you want to see what is the, the voltage difference you measure. This will induce a voltage difference between the, the left and the right. So this will tell you the thermal power. This is the thermal power of your junction, your molecule. So this is the S here. This is the way you experimentally measure. It's called um, c band coefficient. And in theory, we get it like this. It is just this formula. And when you have the negative uh, positive c band, it means your the holes are more uh, like this is a hole dominated transport, which means you are just uh, making a whole device. But if the Seebeck is negative, then you have electron dominated transport. So to say how important the Seebeck is in this junction, because it can help you to know what you are, which kind of transport you are doing, holes or electrons. So the thermal conductance now is, you, you, as you get the, the electrical conductance, you can get the thermal conductance, but the thermal conductance actually comes from two terms, the electronic contribution and the phononic contribution. Phononic contribution is coming from phonons, electronic contribution is coming from. So phononic is vibration of ladies, electronic is electrons induce heating of your system. So similar way as you, you do, you can compute the heat current and the phono heat current, electron heat current, phono heat current. And one of the important parameters you measure in thermal electricity is the ZT. The ZT is the capacity of the material to convert um, electricity, uh, thermal uh, to electrical energy. So, but the main challenge in thermal electricity for any materials, semiconductors, semiconductors or Molecule, molecular junctions is the fact that if you want a high ZT, what do you do? You want uh, your thermal, your electrical conductance and your C back to be high. And then you want this low, this thermal uh, conductance low. But main problem is most of the materials, as you increase the thermal, uh, the electrical conductance, you are also increasing the thermal conductance because of the electronic contribution as many as you have very dense, uh, um, a lot of electrons flowing, then you heat up your system. So your thermal conductivity is high. So what happened is that how do we achieve a very high thermal conductivity, uh, a high ZT without uh, having a high thermal conductance? This is the main question all the people in the field are trying to solve. And uh, it's not easy job. So you need to uh, either increase the uh, seabed or suppress the contribution of uh, the phonons very significantly. But this is something that actually is difficult. But for semiconductors, there are materials that are very good um, thermoelectric materials, but for Molecules, they are still very low Seebeck, like less than one, because for materials to be like, let's say, commercialable, like they take it to the market, should be something like ZT above three. And uh, molecules are not up to there now. So, to sum up, thermal power is um, actually uh, less sensitive to, as I said, electronic transport depends on the electrode molecule couplings, but thermal power doesn't or very less depend on that. And it is possible to probe the thermal power 
probe the semiconductor. So sorry, I made a mistake here. And then I can't see what it didn't. And um, the thermal conductance as well, it's possible since 2018 to prove it. And this, I have to claim here that this has been achieved with our group when I was in Okinawa. Actually, our group was in charge of the theoretical calculation of this uh, kind of breakthrough, small breakthrough. So we are all happy because Yes, this is a very great achievement. The main problem was you need to measure uh, heat at picowatt uh, level. So theoretical limitation still exists for these calculations because you have trouble locating precisely the Fermi level and so on. And there are several adaptive adaptations to that. But the main reason why you have these problems with Fermi level and also density functional theory not being able properly uh, for now when you input your molecules in a junction to properly evaluate your conductance, it kind of overestimate these objects. The reason is because um, DFT is not, uh, is accurate, but not 100% accurate. So it's underestimate the barrier that your electron have to cross here. So since it underestimate the barrier, so DFT, the calculation end up showing that the transmission here is too high. So you end up seeing a conductance, a very high conductance. So we use some methods uh, that is called DFT plus sigma, 50 plus sigma or GW. I don't want you to, to dive into this, but yes, just know that there are methods to correct these and TFT plus sigma, okay, is not necessary. So what's come here is, for instance, to show you one result, for instance, I did on porphyry. So you can see the result of DFT here in a, a dashed line, red dashed line, and then you can see DFT plus sigma. So you can, the conductance is the value you get at zero. So my hand is not it's this value. So this value is very high in uh, DFT compared to DFT plus sigma. DFT plus sigma actually gives you a very good approximation of the experimental value because the values you have here are from the experiments. So let me show you. So this, this has been computed by a group. The porphyrin molecule was synthesized in South Korea and then the electrical measurement by Michigan University. And these are the experimental values. And this is what I get with DFT plus sigma. This is not really far. We, we made it actually. So I was really happy when I got this. And similarly for the CBEC, DFT plus sigma is 4.3 and uh, experimental experiment is 7.3 in the same order of magnitude. We are quite okay. So just to tell you that not only um, we can achieve experiment, uh, experiment like you can get close to the experiment with this transport. Not only DFT itself is accurate to estimate the electron structure, but now we are able with molecules to achieve very good transport values like thermal electric transport values. So some of these success are like what I showed you, the Peltier cooling, like you can see here, this is, um, these are the experimental values that have been plotted on the left side. And you can see what we get from the theory uh, side. This has been done in my group as well. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so we, we can see that it's actually um, really accurate to trust. Um, so most of in the field now, most of the exper experiments are people actually try to get theoretical collaboration to get theory confirmation. The reason is in experiment, they cannot see everything. Like for instance, for the STM uh, measurement, they cannot see what is the connection between, for instance, the carbon, uh, the last carbon and the first gold atom in the metal junction. But we can see it and tell them what is happening. So this gives them more uh, explanation and this make it very beautiful. And this is also 
a very good result that has been gotten recently um, in the heat quantization. Okay. So mechanosensitive molecules. Let me show you a very small video, a very short video. Mechanosensitive molecules are this. So you have a molecule like this. Can you see my screen? No. Yes. Uh, yeah, but can you see the molecule? No. no. Oh, we don't. No. Okay, it. I'll just show you. Can you see it now? Yeah, we see it now, but no movement yet. Yes, okay, good. So this, these are type of molecules. So you have the electrode on the left and the right. And what we do is to stretch or compress these molecules and see how this will affect the electrical properties or the thermoelectric properties of this molecule. If you can see, like when you do the stretching and then you end up breaking the junction, you reach the rupture point at some point. Yes. So these things are this type of experiment I called uh, mechanosensitive molecules. And these mechanosensitive molecules, this is one example that have been done in our group in 2018 again. And uh, we can see that this is uh, a conductance as function of the displacement. So where you have positive values means you are stretching and where you have negative values means you are compressing. So at zero, you have what you get when you do just a normal molecule, like uh, without stretching or compressing. So you can see that what we get after compressing or uh, stretching actually happen to be few order or one or two order of magnitude higher compared to what you get directly. So which means that the mechanical properties of this molecule actually affect the transport and there is a way uh, you explain this by using this, these uh, uh, molecular orbitals by simple quantum chemistry, viewing the molecular orbitals, there is a rule called uh, orbital rule that allows you to understand properly what, why this happened. And this happened because of quantum interference happening. You can see on the right, uh, I'm not drawing, I'm a bit something. Okay. So on the right side, you can see this here. This is just, uh, okay, this is the map of uh, the transmission as function of different energy levels. So you want to view what happened at different orbitals. So what you see here, for instance, is an orbital that goes here and then cross, and then another one here that goes and cross. So you see what is the value of the transmission at each of these orbitals at every level. And what we see is that at some point here, you have the gap somewhere here. The gap is at zero. What you see at zero is the gap, uh, is the Fermi energy, sorry. So you are in the gap. Then you can, what, you can plot this line. This line here is what you are seeing here. And the y, you, you have the drop here because of these quantum interference. The, the quantum interference happening between the top, uh, the top and down level of the bus. Okay, I can't actually go to full screen mode. Okay, good. So this is about mechanosensitivity and you can view uh, these quantum interferences from, uh, for, for instance, which uh, for instance, this is benzene molecule, and you think of connecting this benzene molecule on para para, uh, like para para, or you want it meta meta. But you can see that depending on how you connect it, you can have quantum interference happening because you can see the blue curve here. On the blue curve, it happened that you have a very uh, sharp, uh, how do you say, a very sharp shape here which I, I forgot the exact name. So this shows that you, are, you have quantum, destructive quantum interference at Fermi energy. And if you measure, it means if you connect in parapara, you have a very low conductance compared to, uh, in parapara, you have high conductance compared to meta-meta. 
And this has been also proven experimentally. Um, good. And also, there's the idea of modulating continuity interference uh, by actually different techniques. So how do we control these quantum interference? How do we control these mechanical sensitive properties uh, also into the balance? So you can see that here, this is the junction. Then when you, these X are the positions where you want to input one of these um, other type of molecules, then when you input different uh, type of M1, M2, M3, M4, you end up with a transmission curve that shows quantum interference at different locations, which shows that uh, in some sense, they claim that, okay, they can control these quantum interference uh, where they want the quantum interference in the molecule, like you can move it. If you want high um, conductance then you want to input maybe, let's say, M, M, um, high conductance, you can input M4, because M4 will shift the quantum interference at a different orbital level, so which will be very far from the Fermi energy where you want to measure the conductance value here, so which will be high. But if you input the M2, then you have very strong quantum interference at your Fermi energy, so you have a very low, um, a very low conductance, so not good for transport. Good. Last but not least, so. Now, in the, there are also deep learning techniques. Uh, so with the rising of AI, different things, machine learning, because in the experiment, when you want to do these uh, measurements, you don't do it for once. One of the big problems in experiment is you don't know, you can see this plot here. You don't know when you have really a good connection between these molecules. So they will do a lot of these measurements and see where they have a high uh, reproducibility of their result. And this one will show that uh, they have a very good, uh, the, the right value of the conductance, for instance. So they have to fit all these data and fitting these data, you can call on, basically they use some of the statistical methods of Gaussian or something. But uh, now with machine learning, they use machine learning to, to do it more accurately at a certain uh, rate of success. It depends on the person who does that and the yes, you do. Okay, and also there are very huge uh, projects now to include uh, AI um, on internet ma machine learning and so on, on these new material discovery and so on. But, this new material discovery come into play into the transport in my case, only if we find that this new material is actually interesting for transport. But yes, there is a huge effort and this platform is one of these nano, uh, Nomad laboratory is one of the, uh, one of the European projects on uh, discovering new materials because there are a lot of data on materials, not too much, but uh, quite a lot. So people use it to predict new materials or just play around with uh, machine learning to get new materials, but uh, still to be proven, uh, like uh, once you get it, quick experiment. Good, so I think I'm done. Thank you so much. You have, you can ask questions or offer a job. Thank you, Akpe. Akpe means thank you in one of our local languages in Togo. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Katawura. That was uh, quite really impressive. Uh, a great overview of, uh, of, of this area of physics, uh, which is very, very important, uh, extremely important in Africa, one of the largest groups uh, on the continent. Thank you. Um, questions? Anybody has question, maybe comments? I just have to, to leave right now, sorry, but then I just take the opportunity just to resonate with exactly what Ketavi mentioned. So thank you so much. It was excellent. And you're a great lecturer as well. So it was very instructive. 
in Thank many you so aspects. <laughs> Impressive. I learned a lot as well. And indeed for the application side, this is what I put really quickly as well in my note. I think for the yeah, for the deep learning and any development as well for those quantum positivity, it's really like the future as well. So it's good if you can really master that as well, theoretically and then experimentally. Then for all, the, there will be, I mean, just a little set of questions as well for experimentally, how you really manage to get all those precision when it comes to nanoscale. So this must be very, very uh, challenging. So yeah. I guess that this is, but this is great as you show to have a, such a, a slow, a small difference as well between yeah. the, the experiment and the theory. So yeah, good luck, and uh, so I'll uh, follow up on that. So thank you, and thank you, thank so you thank everybody. You. So I have to jump. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Questions? Um, anybody has questions or comments? So Katawura, the I think on one of the slides you show uh, your theoretical estimate and the measurement from experiments, um, which yeah. were roughly in agreement, uh, but if you can go back to that slide, I have yeah. a feeling that your agreement was even better if uh, yeah. uncertainties are added to both numbers, especially experimental uncertainties. Yeah. Uh, that if the uncertainties are added, maybe you actually will have uh, consistency between those numbers. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. where is that one? Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. If you have, if this, even I think for you, you have theoretical uncertainties for sure, because some of the models are, like you said, uh, have some information that you already know. Yeah. And then the experimental measurement also with have uh, systematics associated, systematic errors associated with them. So if those numbers are added on both sides, then the agreement will be within errors will start getting even better, I would imagine. Yes, I yes, I agree. And in fact, for instance, for the the experimental people actually ah, okay, that one is there. I didn't see it yes. before. Okay, okay, very good. Yeah. I didn't so, I didn't notice it. Yeah, but then the CBEC, there was no uncertainty provided. So we we are not sure how much it is, but we think it should be quietly okay, like in some sense to get close to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you are right. Very good. Other questions? Uh, I think Herman has some comments or questions. I was just, <clears throat> uh, that was a very nice talk. That was, that was very good. I've, I've been very fascinated by the uh, condensed matter physics for many, many years. Uh, but let me just ask you about the, the, uh, the quantum effects are obviously space dependent. In your molecule stretching, for example, you can stretch this thing until it actually, the transmission de uh, deconnects from essentially the source and the, the drain, as you put it. But yeah. is that speed dependent? I mean, the energy is certainly dependent, but how you, you think that these systems always stabilize themselves depending upon how you get to the point of uh, of disconnecting it, and sometimes it may change at that point as well. Mm, yeah. So you mean uh, how you stabilize when you stretch them? Yes, the conductance, uh, you know, changes yes. the function of time, so to speak. Yes. Basically, um, the main thing that happened here would be. Um, let me stop this annotation. Okay. So the main thing that happened here is that when you, we, we stretch the molecule, for instance, we try to, to uh, let's say, to optimize it. In DFT, it's called optimized. So we find optimized position of each of the atoms in the junction. So we are sure that at some point, uh, this molecule at, uh, is at the lowest energy possible. Oh. Then, um, so what affects basically uh, the conductance when you do the stretching? One thing, uh, the stronger one should be how your molecular orbitals will actually overlap as you stretch it. So this is why if you do the same thing with a, you, you see this molecule is a double decker. Can I show you, uh, can you see my screen? 
uh, what I see now. <laughs> yeah, I see conductance over overestimate. Ah, okay. So I will I will just share the whole screen so that you see the movie again. I'll tell you why. I'll, I'll just share the movie. So if you see on this, uh, okay, on this movie, you can see that you have two layers. Okay, drawing, good. So you see that you have a top layer and then another layer here. So which is in fact two groups of molecules, like you are connecting two planes, they are connected through this and the other side there is a connection here. And now you are stretching. And as you stretch, uh, most of the people say is, these, um, there is this pi conjugated system, like you have a pi conjugated system on top, then your molecular orbitals will overlap in some sense, either constructively or destructively. And this have a huge contribution to the transport, depending on whether they, uh, they overlap contractively or destructively. This is one argument that people actually use in the field, but it's not the only one. It's not the only one. And we are still checking what is actually the effect, for instance, of uh, the connecting group you choose, the bridging group you choose, and so on. And where you put it, like what I said, para, para, or parameter, how does yeah. it affect it? All these things are not yet clear to people now. And that depends on the type of material that you've chosen. Apparently. Yes, yes, the type of material you chose. Well. That's really fascinating. That's mm -hmm. just amazing. Thanks so much. Appreciate You're it. welcome. So there's a question by Dagmar. We cannot hear you. Are you muted? You are still muted. Okay. Doug, we, we can hear you. So maybe you want to type your question in the chat? Yeah, maybe you type it. In the meantime, somebody else want to ask a question or has a comment? So Katahura, could you comment a little bit on the state of uh, the development in this area of physics on, on the continent? Is the theoretical aspect more developed, experimental? What exactly is needed, uh, if any, um, for, for more progress uh, 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 in Africa in this area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very, um, very important question. Like uh, for me, um, what is happening is um, people, there are very few groups that are working on DFT, like they use open source DFT codes and they try to publish papers on different materials, uh, on different materials and so on. But the main problem is uh, the transport size is not developed. And also uh, there is no collaboration actually happening because people, uh, basically research in Africa is not uh, actually strongly uh, like uh, well viewed outside so that people will try to collaborate. Even this is very difficult. Collaborations are very difficult even if you are in Europe or USA. But the main thing is that we need to work very hard to prove that we can do very good uh, research on the continent so that people will trust us and uh, bring something in. Then I saw recently that Assessma is working also uh, organizing schools in this field uh, on the continent. And I think this is something good that will actually help people to, to get uh, this field known. Because I think CIS is very computational. We don't need to have a lot of capacities like uh, pay money for experiment. People usually claim there's no money for research and so on. But 
I think yes, since it's very computational, we can use it uh, at some point as a tool to make very good research. And then once the research is good, then maybe we can have very good collaboration outside, or maybe have money for uh, setting up experiments. One of these should work. Yeah. So <laughs> you also said that um, there is now some database to share uh, uh, to share data um across uh, in in this field so is this like uh, open source uh, that people can access this data and 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 either do some simulation or compare results or how how does that work and is it available for worldwide uh, also african institutes can participate in this data sharing yes yes i think it's a uh, open source there are many of these open source and there are most of them are academic based, so you can access them from anywhere. You can also add your own. Maybe I can just make a list and just share with everyone at some point so that people can who have access to, to it. Yeah, I think that would be great. Uh, if you can send that list to the ASP list, uh, that would be, you know, I think a lot of people will be interested. Good, good, I will, I will do that. Any other questions or comments? All right. In that case, uh, Katavura, thanks very much. Akpe, Akpe no, Akpe kaka. Thank you. Akpe, Akpe no, Ocha. Yes. Okay. Merci beaucoup. So, okay. So we will stop here. Oh, that. 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 Your question still. Can you speak now? We still cannot hear you. Maybe you remove your, your earphone. No. We cannot hear. Oh, so uh, send, okay, send your question or comment by email to Katawura, okay? Yeah. Yeah, write yeah. to me by email. Yeah. His email address is on the Indigo agenda page. You will see his email there. Just send it to him by email then. I also send it in the chat, so. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. His email address is also, uh, I think, uh, yeah. Oh, he has it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just have a simple question on the conductance. Might be naive. Why those two model, porphyrin, Porphyrin sigma have different curves, so that was his question in the chat. Ah, okay. Uh, how? Why the DFT and DFT sigma have different curves? Okay, okay, good. <laughs> I will just share my screen again. And I will show you. Good. Okay. So I said I will not talk about this, but uh, I will end up talking. About it. Okay, good. So when you do the calculation for DFT, for instance, you get the homo, the homo level here and the lumo here. So what happened is this homo and lumo are actually uh, not the correct one from your DFT. The proper DFT, oh, sorry. So, this homo lumo, what happened is that DFT sigma, what DFT sigma does is it takes these two levels uh, like this and move the lumo up and move the homo down. Why is that? So the value by which you move these depends are the expressions I gave here. So this take into account the screening, the ionization potential, the, the screening of, uh, uh, of your molecule inside, because you put your molecule inside uh, gold electrodes, so metallic contact. So you assume like you have two planes, two charged planes facing your molecule. So you want to uh, compute what is the amount of charge these, um, these two planes will add to your molecular system. And the amount of charge that will be added, actually, you want to correct that 
by uh, by removing it so that you make your system kind of uh, free. So this happened by removing or by shifting the orbitals. So you shift the LUMO, you shift the LUMO, and then you shift everything below and everything above. So all the energy levels, all the orbitals. And this is why you end up having um, this here. You end up having a difference in the homo. You see, at the beginning with DFT, I had this here. So you can see that these blue, the blue and the red is just a shift. The blue is just a shift of the red dotted one. You see, it? so which, which uh, actually lower your conductance, but you have to choose the correct value of this shift. This is what the, uh, sigma does. So DFT plus sigma. Is that okay? Hello. Uh, but he, we cannot hear him, so I'm not sure we can know what he's saying. <laughs> ah, okay, good, good, thank you. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, I think Ketebi is now out of, no? Are you working with any industries in Africa? With regard to, sorry, uh, are you working with any industries in Africa with regard to, you know, uh, no, no, electronics no. or anything like that? Yes, basically, what, when I, I talk about industries, you can see that most of these uh, companies are U.S. companies like Intel. Aside from the uh, Asian company like TSMC, Samsung, you see Intel, uh, Microsoft. They are the leading one, but TSMC, basically even in Europe is very difficult to find uh, companies, but they, they are there. But even if you find mostly they are uh, like representation from US companies. In Europe, there is, a, uh, in France, there is a ST Microelectronics as well, but uh, very difficult. These technologies are so difficult to handle now, to implement at the level of research in Africa. And uh, we need, this is why I said it is, uh, we need to work more. And now I'm in um, postdoc in Germany, but yes, it's very difficult to get positions in Africa. Uh, so if I get one, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, can, I can try to help like uh, to, to improve, like train more students and try to improve. But yes, it's also very political to get a position in Africa. Like in 2020, I went to Togo and I spent one year there and uh, there was nothing that came up. <laughs> like, yeah. So now I'm looking for something uh, to, to get a permanent position. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. I have to work on that. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm working on that, but I need help. <laughs> yeah, we all will. We, we, I'll, I'll keep my eyes open as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're amazed at what things can happen these days. Yes. <laughs> Good luck. One of these miracles. Okay, so Kitivi, uh, sorry, Kitivi, are you there? Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Good. Um, okay, guys, I think we sh can stop. Uh, we can stop now. Uh, sorry, I uh, I had to connect for another 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 engagement, which uh, that, that's why. But this is very brilliant, uh, Katawura. Um, we'll be in contact. I'm very impressed by what uh, you have shown us here and what you are doing, and it's great. It's really great to see colleagues from the continents who are. Uh, who are doing really uh, this well, yeah. So please continue. And I see now that you're in Germany and uh, we'll be in touch with you and invite you again to talk to us. Thank you so much. And I'm honored to be here with you, Kedevi. And uh, I have to say you are inspired, inspiring us to continue 
like helping others. So yes, I think this is what we will continue doing. Great. Um, before we go, Umaka, you is there anything you want to say? Uh, I uh, yeah. So hello. Um, uh, hi, Uma. Yeah. Hi. I'm sorry. I had to do some back and forth <laughs> with other things happening here. But I think I catch the main point with Kataura, uh, and I'm really impressed by what I've seen. <laughs> and uh, it's very um, positive to see how far they've come. I mean, those all those people who were in Dakar five or seven years ago, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got done a great job. I've seen uh, Sam Yellow and others, what they've been doing on COVID. And yeah, that's, that's very uh, interesting and uh, make us comfortable trying to help uh, African students and so on. And I think I will get in touch with you, Katamura, yes, um, as we're trying to organize physics in West Africa. And I've seen that you're already doing some networking. And yeah, yeah we have to uh, do something. Yes, yes. OK. Yes. And thanks uh, to the ISP for giving this opportunity to hear what you've been doing. So KTV and all co-workers, Christian, Christine, and so thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Great, uh, Uma, thank, uh, thanks. Uh, Professor Umaka has uh, been always uh, supportive of our SPSP effort and continue uh, so as uh, Dr. Herman White here. So uh, thanks everybody for connecting. And uh, next week we'll hear from another brilliant uh, Togolese, uh, Sumielo Azote um, on biophysics. So we're looking forward to, to that. Um, so uh, Kosi, We'll hear from Kosi later on, uh, um, I think in September. So, okay. yeah. Okay, thanks everybody, and we'll end the meeting now. Yeah. Bye bye. Go on. Good glucleage. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.